MISAC RUCTF 101 call, and I know everyone on the call knows this, but just for anyone who may see this on YouTube, basically this was the Russian CTF. There was 100 teams worldwide, and of course MISAC was the, the Michigan team that we did uh, just a couple weeks back in November 2011. So on the call, we've got me, Wolf Gorlick, and I'm going to announce Keith Taz Drummer, because I know he's on mute at the moment, so he's joining us as well. He was helping out with the Python code analysis. And um, Ryan Harp, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, my name is Ryan Harp. I'm just, uh, I was just, um, I'm not the coder, so um, I just happened to help out where I could. Sounds good. That was a, one of the flags I know we're going to look at is the IPS, and if I recall correctly, you're the first one to point those out, so it's definitely good to have you on the call. Yeah. And um, Chris, Radis? So you got his phone on mute as well. <laughs> well Chris is with us, Radis of the Rats and Rogues. Um, Z Tango, are you there? Yeah, I just on you. Hey, Z. Hey. So, uh, Joshua and Z Tango. Uh, during the CTF, I primarily was doing uh, some code analysis on the, uh, what was it, the marketplace application. Uh, did a little bit of curl stuff for some of the final end piece for the uh, for the chat piece that we did end up using too much of. Um, that was funny. Sounds good. And uh, Rashad, join those Cheerios. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rashad Williams. Um, I'm beginner to quite a bit of these things. Uh, I'm taking classes that I would like to just actually. In, uh, oh, I actually want to do more with just the overview of the small classes I've taken because I realized that. Without implementing and using SJ, it really doesn't help process. So <laughs> I'm just trying to get my feet wet and and create a, a starting point. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hear that. You know, it's, it's, it's a world of difference when you go to try and apply what you have that's only book knowledge. Right. So I'm thinking back to the lunch I had with uh, Josh from like. Yeah, I was working on this, and I understood in the book knowledge, but it took me 11 hours. And he's like, eh, that was, that was about five minutes for me. <laughs> I, I get it, man. Uh, D. Tom, you're, you're just really thorough, Wolf. That's it. <laughs> yeah, really thorough. <laughs> it's very well documented what I did, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Derek. So, yeah, I'm uh, Derek Thomas, D. Tom, in, uh, in the channel. Um, just kind of general backup, uh, try to do some recon, do some check out, um, you know, the beginnings of uh, most of the challenges. Didn't really get too far, just tried to help out where I could. All right, sounds good. Good to have you here, man. And one, at one point in time, you got to tell me what this is about a theme song. <laughs> I'm dying to know. And the Ghostbusters, but all right. too. too. Oh, Ghostbusters. Yeah. That's it, huh? Yeah, I'll tell you later. <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're going to have to tell me some more. Uh, all right, so today's agenda, 101 call basics. So what were the goals and the scoring? Um, how do we download and set up the RUCTFE image? Some basic service enumeration, how to walk through and get in and out of instances. Uh, file enumeration, find the files. Uh, a couple basic hacks. and. Uh, and then a quick overview of patching the services. I was hoping to do a little bit of a walkthrough on that, but I realized after the after the fact that that was actually on the VPN, so we can't really patch the image. But uh, with that, so the RUCTF, this is the scoreboard. And at first, we didn't know exactly what the services were. So this, when it released, we could tell that uh, you know we're getting scored on points for defense, which includes like uptime. And they're actually checking that every three minutes. And what was interesting about that too was their checks were not doing a simple you know TCP port as your port open. They're actually downloading file. Um, in the case of the meteoros, 
those downloading file and your image had to actually manipulate that file and upload it in a timely fashion. Um, and in the case of uh, Twitter or Twitya, it was actually their processes were creating new users. So was, there's a lot going on in that regards. Um, so, you know, uptime meant the server was online, the port was listening, services were functioning, and um, services were actually downloading the flag. So the other thing that I found was interesting was is that the clean image ha actually has no flags on it. So the flags were being dynamically generated throughout the, the competition. There's what, 100% um, was 1,918 points. So I'll figure that out. It's worth, what, about five points in every check? And then they had points for attack, which is the number of flags we captured, and uh, more points for more complex flags, with 5,015 points being available. Advisories was kind of interesting. I know we didn't actually get any advisories, but if you found the flags, found the attacks, you could submit a code patch to, um, to them as an advisor and get extra points for that. And there's only 17 possible points there, so Actually, a lot of the, the top players got to be the top by submitting the advisories. So that was it. And then once we knew, um, once we knew what the services were, we could set up Dratus. So I'm going to do a quick flip here to Dratus. Do you guys see my screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Good deal. Yeah. So, uh, Josh, you, you had set up the the Dratus, and I tried to emulate basically what you had on our, our new public MishSec Dratus. But basically, if I remember correctly, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you had RUCT app and then app one through eight. Yeah, I think we actually had like app one through four because we had, when we were actually using it, uh, I think we dumped a lot of stuff just in the general top layer. Uh, more so, I think, just out of expediency it, it, not being familiar, I think, with the tool and how it, how it gets used for organizations and stuff like that, but that's close right. up. So I'm, I'm assuming that were we to do this again, we would then go ahead and name all these apps after these points. I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. So by clicking on the folder, we can drill into it, change the name. And yeah, during the actual contest, it went pretty quick, and we didn't do much with the Dratus. But after the work, after the fact, I've been playing around with it quite a bit, talking to the guys over there. And it's actually pretty handy. But uh, let me finish this up. So we get market was another one. Portfolio meteoros was. Um, And then Twitia. So once we knew what the points were, we could go ahead, name all the folders, start doing some recon. And uh, the actual image was provided to us the day before. So we had the image downloaded and ready to be encrypted. And one of the things we did was we had downloaded onto SSD drives to be pretty quick. Um, <laughs> actually. There was one team that didn't even get the, the file downloaded and decrypted in time um, just because of, of the hardware they're using it. So that worked out pretty good for us. But still, it's, it takes a long time to decrypt. So there's the, there's the file right there. It's PGP encrypted. I'm going to go ahead and start the decryption. It's just, you know, GPG output to get the OVA file, decrypt it with the passphrase. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with GPG, ordinarily you, you do GPG to a recipient, but in this particular case you um, use a symmetric encryption, so they give you the pass key, it's pretty easy. That way you don't have to exchange any certificates or whatnot. That will actually take about five minutes to download. So it's downloading, I'm going to jump real quick to the network configuration. So the way the network was configured was actually 10.23.01 was the organizers. And uh, we are given all the information to connect the VPN up the week of the, the competition. 
Everyone was 1023, and then your team number. Um, one for your VPN router, and then four for a test box, which was uh, an image that had uh, all the open ports that the actual vulnerable box that we were attacking, protecting, would have. But uh, that that was available along with the VPN early, so that we could go ahead and make sure we had full connectivity. So we knew right away what everyone's IP address was going to be. You know, we were 1023.84.3, and it was 1023.1 through 99. So we didn't have to do too much post enumeration. We knew where they were. We also had workstations, of course, that were hanging off. And uh, we were using, for our setup, 100 to 254. And then we had a IP tables rule to prevent people from coming in on those particular IP addresses so that our workstations would be protected. And one of the things we were talking about doing, I think would be pretty cool to do next year, would be also to drop in a um, tarp it. So for the people who are scanning everything about four looking for workstations and to mess with the competition, we'll get stuck in the tarp it. I think the tarp it idea would be, um, would be nice. Um, I think there was a lot of scanning. I think we were worried about... Uh, you know, different types of attacks going on, or think that may have brought our services down at some point. So, that could be helpful maybe next year. Yeah, exactly. You know, the other thing too that I thought was neat. Speaking of scanning and whatnot, was one of the other teams had, and and Zetango had also recommended this today. The competition had set up um, TCP dump on the actual VPN, and so yeah. they had people. Who were uh, who were taking the ports for the services they were protecting, and watching the dump just for that port traffic? I think that would have been good because we would have definitely seen those W gets on the uh, for the IPS really fast. You're right. If someone was monitoring that. That'd be easy to see. Yeah. So we could have figured that out a lot quicker. I think. Agreed. I wonder if that was even an intended path to get flags, you know? Because that seems so rudimentary to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my thought when I saw that was that we could feed that IPS some ridiculous string and get it to dump that stuff, um, some sort of injection attack. Mm -hmm. You know, and, yeah, then, and what, then just yeah. trying the W get was kind of just a, well, hey, let's just try this. I doubt it'll work, but, you know. I just, uh, it, you know, and, that, and the fact that it got shut off or people started protecting it better at the end, you know, because for a while there we couldn't do anything with the WGET. You couldn't get, it wouldn't dump any of that information. Well, I found out what was going on there was that the organizers were periodically deleting and emptying out that flag file. Okay. So they would refresh the flag. Every few minutes there would be new flags or it would be empty for 15, 20 minutes or an hour, and then there would be more flags. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But there's also other things. Um, I mean, the SQL queries. I think you would see a lot of the HTTP traffic would have been interesting to uh, to analyze, and I think it could have got us uh, pretty far because a lot of that was HTTP uh, attacks. I think. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Think, yeah, I think that would have been helpful. Yeah, considering I don't think any of those services really used any kind of. Uh, transport layer uh, encryption. So even just a basic TCP dump at that point would have been helpful. I was sitting and watching the uh, the actual uh, Apache log for Marketplace as I was going through the code review for that, trying to see if there was anything that was coming in. Um, and really at that point, that service got very, very little play uh, against us. Uh, there was, I think, one person that was running some kind of just an automated scanner that uh, when we tried to reuse the actual attack string that was in there, it really did very, very little against the service. Um, mm -hmm. Then the only other traffic we were seeing at that point uh, was the actual organizer, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the checks, and the uh, feed of the new flag back into the system. So. Interesting. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of things that we can do uh, better next year around the the 
router in in terms of capturing data, in terms of, of preventing attacks. Um, the, the decryption just finished, so I'm going to hop in over to that. One thing about an OVA file that I found, I didn't know about this, so I'll just share it with you guys. Maybe you guys knew, maybe you didn't. But did you guys know it's a TAR file? So no. the OVA, yeah. I, I had to figure that out because the virtual box that actually comes with Ubuntu off apt-get doesn't support OVAs. So it's actually a, a tar file that holds the OVA, which of course you manifest in your dis definition and then your disk, which doesn't really matter for this competition, but I thought that was kind of interesting. So once we've got the file downloaded, decrypted, we can go ahead and run it and import the appliance. Go through and do that. There's the file. I'm going to go ahead and change just a couple things on it here. One of the things I don't like is that the default for these images is actually the C drive. So one of the things I ran into during the competition is my C drive filled up, <laughs> which wasn't good. So I moved that off into the E drive. So once that imports, then we can go ahead and take a look at what services there are. Um, we'll set the password, set the IP address. I use a slightly different IP address today as opposed to the, the competition, so it's actually on my network, so I can show you guys a couple other things. And I also, later on, during this call, I'll show the um, RUCTF 101 MySec, which was the actual image we were running during the competition. Actually, let me shut that off. Power you off. So the patches were pretty cool. What was interesting about that is, and I'll just dive into that then while I'm waiting for this because I can't demo it anyways. About halfway through the competition, I guess they did this the last competition too, the organizers went ahead and released patches. So that was a good way to figure out where the vulnerabilities were. We ran into two issues getting the patches on the box. The first issue was that um, it was for the unstable version, so it was for Wheezy as opposed to Squeeze. We had to go in and, and edit the um, distros list, the sources list, so that it would actually pull from Wheezy. And another thing was, as we'll see in just a minute, because they're running um, virtualization, you actually had to zip into each one of the virtual instances to do the patches. So it took a little bit to, to figure out. And then, um, Josh, how are you doing the patch defs? You had mentioned that you were looking, actually looking at the disk between the old and the new. Well, what I had done is I'd actually pulled down the, uh, the, uh, the files directly from the server. Uh, so just the, just the, the, the problem Python code at that point. Um, so I already had that on the machine. So it was just a simple, as soon as we patched it, I grabbed a new version and threw it to just, uh, I think it was WinDiff at that point. Um, so just real basic, straight up. Diffing of two tech files. Okay, so you're doing you did Windows? Yeah. Oh, cool. That makes sense to me. All right, so that um, we got the image down. The other thing we did, which kind of saved our our bacon, was we took a snapshot before getting too far down the road. Well, actually, I think we set the IP address first. Let me do that first. But we uh, took a snapshot so that later on when our box got pretty whacked up, we were able to keep running. At some point during the competition, I think a couple teams got frustrated because they started doing uh, 
quite destructive attacks, and our image got pretty messed up at a, at one point, so we reverted and patched it and put it back into production. So we got the file downloaded. We got it decrypted. The next thing we got to do is set the password. And the way we do that is we go ahead and edit the grub. Actually, Dot Hack had showed me this because I was playing around with the 2009, 2010 images, and I didn't have the password. So, you know, like, here's the documentation to do it. So, thank you, Dot Hack. We change it from read only to read write, from quiet to single mode. We tell it to init the bash shell. Just like that. Go ahead and log, boot it up. Set the password, pass WD. Go ahead and reset it. Next thing we're going to do is get on the network. Which again was that 1023, our team number, dot three. I'm going to use a slightly different IP address than our config right now, but the day of, that's what we're running. So I'll switch to that in just a second. Let me get this interface set, etc. Network interfaces. So our team number is 84. Now we'll go ahead and just give it a reboot. And you see it's going ahead and shutting down. So on the containers, um, Kyle picked that up right away. So let me go ahead and get this slideshow back up from current slide. So yeah, you got, you know, open uh, VZ started and open VZ shutting down and he picked it up right away. And uh, what it is is Linux container virtualization. So this is some verbiage off of um, open VZ's page. Basically it creates a, a multiple secure isolated Linux container on a single physical server. What that actually means is that each one of those containers has its own file system um, which is a, a virtual mount point off of the main file system. Each one has its own IP stack. Uh, I mentioned patching earlier. Each one has its own um, app to get sources list, you know, patches, the whole nine yards. So that was one of the things that was a little bit tricky on this because without knowing about OpenVZ, it was very difficult to figure out where the processes were all running under. Yeah, they got a, a wiki that I was checking out. It's pretty helpful. And let's see, is she back up yet? So once that's coming up, we'll hop on to the very first, you know, service enumeration, which is just your, your port scanning. And uh, Rashad had actually done a bunch of the port scanning. I kept coming back to him, what, what port is what again? And what I found out with, uh, yeah. It's like, where is everything? Well, we found out with Drata Zone, it's pretty cool, is that you can actually import uh, an Nmap scan. So if we look, it's 
she's still coming up. And we do a standard NMAP scan and save it out to a file, for example, RUCTFE. Check for your open ports. Check your specific port numbers to make sure you do the whole range because the base one, the base NMAP scan will miss ports. So let's do this. Come on, busy. Do the virtual containers have their own IPs as well? Absolutely. Like, uh, okay. Natted or something? Yep, natted. And that was another thing that kind of confused us. We're looking at the IP tables for the VPN. Was that they had natted all of the um, virtual IP addresses out? which yeah. didn't make a lot of sense to us at the time. But in hindsight, it makes perfect sense. Well, so this guy's up. Actually, I was going to say, if you go into each one of the instances and start doing that stat on them, you'll see some common ports that were shared amongst uh, each one of the interfaces. So that kind of explains some of the matting and the fact um, that uh, the server itself was only exposing the specific a a application interface ports where you may have two of them that were running in MySQL instance, both of them on 3306. Uh, and so that allowed each of the individual containers themselves to run uh, similar services without uh, uh, kind of report conflicts and other things like that. So. Makes sense. So on, on the Drata side, you can import our NMAP scan. So we go to our NMAP scan, browse to it, and A refresh. <laughs> so now what we have is we have all the open ports from the challenge. So I can drag that up onto our project. Then we can go ahead and this is another thing that Rashad had done the day of the competition is actually pull up a browser. Go to each one see what it is. Support, uh, no, not my Google Plus. Port 3300. Okay. That looks better. There we go. So once we got it up, once we port scan it and port the ports, we can look to see in Dratus what ports are where. And then we can pull the ports up and see, for example, that 3300 is Yeah. We can start putting some information in Dratus. So, for example, say, you know, hey, all the virtual servers are with OpenVZ, and here's how to switch the instances. So we ended up whiteboarding the VZ, CTL, enter to get in, to get out. VZ, CTL, restart to bounce them. Um, yeah, and and, we and start, putting that formatting in is something that we learned after the fact. But I think that would have helped a lot of people. Um, I actually used Dratus from an information, um, you know, a, a research standpoint as opposed to just dumping information. The, the one that we had on the day of the competition was a mess because it was just um, straight. Uh, uh, so it, it, uh, it essentially 
they do is take out the, the title and description tags that there. Uh, essentially, they're just written out Meteorosos basics, uh, and then the IP address or that uh, that URL that's there in the summary page that would look, look like a hot mess at that point. Um, so, getting those those title and description blocks in there, I think, is really going to be key for us when we actually use that. That's a lot easier to find something in than something that's just a complete mess. That looks like that. There you go. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> there's the mess. <laughs> There's with the actual title and the description and everything. Yeah, so compare that. To just click on the, the top of the, the import there. And what's this like? So if we go to 80, 80 I believe is FFD9. I'm just going ahead and adding notes with, hey, the basic information, here's what port it's on. Fast Music is actually on two ports. I guess it's on 50100 and also 82. There's the Fast Music service. So we can go ahead. And any one of these can be double-clicked and edited, which is another thing I like. You know, as we learn more, we can go ahead and keep updating it. So I'm just flipping through the ports, open them up in a browser. There's port 443, crypto message server, which is good because when I originally saw CMS, I thought they meant something like, you know, a CMS. But no, crypto. One hundred fifty. So yeah, a lot of these were on very high ports. So it gets back to what I was saying earlier about Nmap. We had actually specified the ports. I was going back through this the second time. I didn't do that, and I was like, wait a minute, we're missing a whole bunch of services. So you got Twitia, Meteoros section, two ports. So we go, go ahead and update Meteoros. Again, we can double click any one of them to add more information. And IPS, which is what, 3255. Looks like it's slowing down again. So that was IPS 3255. Oh, HTTP. There we go. IPS 3255. The other thing that was interesting about this was the whole rules. And I'm not sure yet we know why, but there's a bunch of rules that kept getting added and removed to our IPS during the competition made it a little bit interesting. And then the last one was two one two one. Which prompts you to authenticate. Go ahead and create an account. You'll see this is actually the marketing one. So I add a note here to say marketing basics. At this point in time we should have each one ESP basics, except for ESP done. Fast music, IPS, market, meteoros, Twitya. Good deal. So just by process of elimination, the only port that doesn't come up is 222. So most likely that is going to be our ESP basics. So I'll just throw on a quick note on that.
So now we got all the services covered. So that would be port enumeration. What else we got here? Ba, 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 ba. Entering instances. All right, so this is the VC CTRL that took us a little bit to figure out. So yeah, the way you enter it is doing VCCTL, enter then the instance number. And then you see it goes from the host, which would be our UCTF 2001, down to the instance. Now I'm in root one. And then getting back to the main is just exit. So if you enter one of them, you can list the processes and see what you have running. We can see one is actually doing the FFD9 processes. And we can also look at the home folder, see if there's anything interesting there. Some of them have source code on the home folder, some don't. And Derek, you're mentioning um, IPs, right? Yes. So if you look, it's actually VNet adapters. So this is instance one, which oh, is holding FFD9. Yep, you see how it's got a it's bound to 192.168.0. Mm -hmm. I notice all of them are like that. So if you go on to instance two, and the command I wanted. So instance two is on one nine two one six eight zero two, and so on and so forth. Instance three is. Oh, give me my commands. Hmm. Instance three is on instance three. So if you flip through all these, you see we already mentioned one is FFD9, um, two is ESP. Let's take a look at three. Oh, it's actually in three. Okay. Three, we got Meteoros. See Python Home Meteoros. Four. Kind of hard to see any process that we recognize, but when you go to home on four, see it's actually the Twitya service. So you know four is Twitya. I'm not sure which one is five. There's nothing home, and I don't recognize any of those services. That was a MySQL one, though. Five is, is that marketplace. It is. Five is marketplace. Right. Yeah. Okay. Then we got six. Auto vacuum. That's another one. I'm not exactly sure which one that is yet. Yeah. Is there any way to see what um, TCP port these things are listening on, like a NetStat? Yeah, with NetStat. With NetStat? Yeah. You have to be in the, in, in the instance. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, once we go through and flip through all those, we can go ahead and put together a... Use the N flag there. Ah, uh, N. Thanks. A-N. A-N? Yeah. So, since that's the 443, that's got to be uh, CMS. So, 6 is CMS. That would be my guess. It's really the only one that's using HTTPS. Yep. 
that makes sense. So we can go ahead and add another note with our mappings. And I'm not going to bore you guys with doing the copy and pasting, but what I would, what I was also doing as I was going back through this is going through and editing all these to include how to get to the VZ and what internal IP address it has. So I'll go ahead and edit that later. But yeah, at a basic level, that's all it was to getting in and out of the instances, although it took us a little bit of time to figure that out. And then once we have the instances up, of course, we can see what process they're running, what process they're looking at, what port was with netstat slash an, you're saying? Yeah. And that is it for service enumeration. The other thing then becomes actually looking for the flags, which we knew what the uh, regex was from the rules. They had already given us that, so then we can just hop in and do a regex scan for that particular flag. The other thing that I was looking at was, um, let me see if I can get back to it. Under var lib vz lives all the folders for the actual uh, containers. So if you go into, say, private one, that's the actual file system for the first container. So what's nice about that is you can actually search, instead of having to go into any one particular container, or each particular container to do a regex, you can actually search at the private folder and go all the way down, down the stream. Which was at 10, W, Backslash. Equals dollar sign. Backslash. Yes. Thank you. So the same thing I did last time. And then I'll go ahead and search all the folders. Now, right now, there are no files in this particular image. Which I'm going to shut this image off because this is a clean image. And it gets back to what I was mentioning earlier about on the day of the competition, they're actually downloading the flag files. So I'll fire up another one here. Oh, this is shutting off. Now, the other thing also is that it, it, some of these services were putting flags in, uh, in, in MySQL database as a Postgres SQL, base, uh, SQL database and a SQL lights database, I believe. Uh, so you had to know that how to get into each one of those uh, instances or uh, database engines within each one of the instances. And did we capture any flags out of the databases? Um, well, we could read our own flags. <laughs> I don't know whether or not we were actually able to uh, to pull them from other persons for other things uh, to the to the uh, actual applications themselves. And we were, I can't remember. I didn't see the I didn't look through the Twitch uh, piece itself to find out how it was storing its flags. Um, so Twitya and IPS were the two that we were getting flags that I knew of. And IPS was that flags file, which I'll pull up in just a second. Twitya was, they had a, the organizers had a user process that would log in, create an account, post messages and whatnot. That would include the flags. All right, so this is a actual, the actual image that we were using the day of the competition with a snapshot created after the competition ended. And the flags one was on the IPS. And we go ahead and do that grep here. Goes ahead and sees that it's actually in the flags file. And Ryan, you were, you were taking the lead on this one. You want to talk about the IPS a bit? Yeah, so when we first, um, when, you know, when we first browsed to it just uh, through the web uh, page, 
Um, my first instinct, and I think a lot of people's, was there's got to be a way to get it to dump flags via a bad rule um, to write in the, uh, the part that, where you write uh, the IPS rules or, or something like that. But um, as we got into it, I just I wasn't getting anywhere with that, and um, so I, I just I think um, you know D Tom was walking around. We were he was over, and we just kind of started looking through. Um, the actual the container the VZ container and it I just noticed that there was a flags.txt file sitting in the uh, what would have been the uh, root of the home directory of the uh, of that VZ container so uh, all uh, all I really did is just you know I, I opened it up and noticed that most of the things in that file matched the regex and at that point uh, and I was still thinking along the lines of somehow we got to get this to dump the flags.txt text file um, and not really thinking about it just kind of said well hey let's just try to do a wget or a curl or whatever on the file and see if it'll pull down from some other uh, um, from one of the other vulnerable images that were out there so I just picked one and did it once it didn't work did it a second time and it went um, and then at that point, I think um, one of the other guys, uh, I can't quite remember his name, um, that was Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, yeah, that Mark brought, wrote up a script to go out and just hit um, all the uh, up IPs uh, of all the, all the vulnerable images and just periodically check for that and download and grab that text file. And then I think Mark scripted up uh, um, just a, a mechanism to dump those flags to the scoring server. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, it was really, uh, I mean, just happened to be looking through the container and found the flags file. It wasn't any thing. And then I, I think kind of luck to, you know, try wget. Because I honestly didn't think, you know, just doing a simple wget would actually work to get anything. Um, but it did. Makes sense. <laughs> Actually, most most of the flags we got was that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So I got I don't know if you guys can see it or if it'll show up on the screen, but as you've been talking through it, I've actually been walking through the process of finding it on the home folder as the flags file. Again, that grep file that will show what's in there. Mm -hmm. Looking at it with Nano, seeing it in the web browser. I sent you an email right before the start of the con call. Did you get that? Yeah, with the um, with the netcat script. Yeah, and I think that was used for Twitya. Yeah, if I'm right, if I fifty one hundred was that Twitya? Yeah. yeah. D one hundred. Okay, I, I for a second I got those two confused. So, but I'm pretty sure that netcat script was used for Twitya, right? Yeah. Um, one hundred fifty. There was a backdoor in one of those that was 5100, I think. What did I think 5100 was the IPS? Fast Music? The fast Music was the 5100. We got flags off Fast Music, too? Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, so that net cat, uh, I'll bring it up so everyone can see it. Awesome. Yeah, we don't have to keep my bash uh, scripting inadequacies on the base. Yeah, I, I cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> we need it for that did, that did not make the greatest for historical purposes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, but, it, but it did make the slightly more public video recording, so. Right, exactly. You want me? Yeah. Which is fine. You're, you're I'm working on that. I've actually been, uh, I've actually been going through Bash uh, tutorials since the since the CTF. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, my my Linux scripting is poor. I don't know. In, in my way of thinking, if it doesn't run C sharp. 
But yeah, guys, that was that was just the basics, the 101, how to do Nmap, how to map things up, how to get in and out of instances, how to look at processes. I definitely have to go over this <laughs> at home. And how to get things up onto um, RUCTF. The image is available if anyone wants it. You can download it off my site. I'll shoot you guys a link. The uh, the one with the flags or without. Does, uh, does everybody get what that regex is actually looking for? Or is it the, the, the people that are not familiar with that kind of uh, notation? I didn't hear what he said. I said, uh, it, does everybody know what exactly that regex is actually looking for? So at least when you see that, are you familiar enough with regex to, to, to see exactly what it's trying to get at? But. Oh, it's trying to filter out that string or that uh, pattern, right? Right. Essentially what this what this is saying is that that uh, carrot at the end, I'm moving my mouse around as you can actually see it. Um, the carrot at the, at the beginning of it essentially says the, this is going to mark the beginning of a line. Uh, so essentially line start. The backslash W is going to look for uh, in extended or PCRE for compatible red regular expressions notation. Any word character, which is essentially uh, upper and lower alphabetical numbers, I believe dashes and underscores, it may just be dashes. Um, the curly braces say we're going to look for this instance exactly 31 times. Then the equals is just the, literally the equals character. And then the dollar sign is the end of line. So essentially, we're looking for a line that contains only 31 word characters and an equal sign, and that's it. Oh. So without without the caret, without the uh, uh, essentially without the end and uh, uh, beginning of line characters, we're essentially denotes a, a full flag. So well, if you want to bring up one of those, yeah, there we go. So if you take a look at that, each one of those is going to be 31 word characters and an equal sign. I look forward to seeing Mark's script that he wrote to actually take these out and submit them into the scoring system. Yeah, I was interested in seeing that as well. How's that? How did you write that? Do we know? It's Ruby. I'm pretty sure. Ruby? Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Pretty sure. Yeah, I have to read more character. What is it? Pattern matching and <laughs> just regular expressions. So. Yeah, if regular you're into Perl, regex is um, used used a lot. Am I correct, C Tango? Really, red, well, it, Perl, Perl is, it works really well with regular expressions, but it's not limited to Perl. Um, True. So really, yeah. you can do it. I mean, you, you saw Wolf do it with just, with just rep um, beforehand. So I mean, learning regular expressions uh, is a really good way to just be able to quickly filter and manipulate text. 